to their futures Soldiers speak out Soldiers speak out If by any chance the ISAF US um, hears that he has declared a state of emergency they could choose to support Karzai or to support the parliament which are at loggerheads and then if Karzai was not supported by ISAF, who's in charge? Well, these are very big issues, and I, I, I scoured the internet this morning, called other friends, anybody see anything? Not a word. So I know it's important to have our delegation there. It's a very, very dicey time, but it's not easy to think of a time when it wasn't. Um, but I'm also joined here today by Doug Mackey and Larry Kirshner, and they'll be going over to Afghanistan in the very, very near future. So I'd like to first start with a video that was taken in Afghanistan a week ago. And on this particular trip, two veterans from war in Afghanistan, Brock McIntosh and Jacob George, are interviewed. Notice they're wearing blue scarves, and we'll talk to you about that soon. They're interviewed by our very dear friend, Hakim. Hakim is a Singaporean MD who has begun a project with the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers, which really put wind in my sails and has been, to me, emblematic of one of the finest nonviolence projects I've ever experienced. So you'll hear Hakim introducing these two veterans from war in Afghanistan who, when they come back, assure us that they're going to found a new chapter of Veterans for Peace. Mm. It'll be called Afghan Veterans for Peace. So oh, maybe yeah. we can have a round of applause for the <laughs> Introducing Brock McIntosh with Hakeem questioning him. The boys have been looking for to meeting you. I've been waiting to. <laughs> How are you feeling now? I'm um, feeling a part of something pretty large and pretty enormous. Um, I remember when I f was flying over the mountains here on the way, uh, feeling the contrast between how I felt when I came here the first time. And I was afraid coming here. And I felt immediately alienated from the Afghan people before I even arrived. But this time I felt um, eager to, to mingle with Afghans and to listen to them and to, to grow with them and to build relationships with them and I feel a part of something very enormous. To have hope and to have patience. Um, the teacher that we had met earlier, I think, put it put it well when he said that adults will continue to do what the adults do, but the youth make up over half of the population and they're the ones that are going to be changing Afghanistan in the future. And um, throughout history, especially in the last 100 years, much of the great changes that happen in societies come from the youth because they haven't lost their naivety, they haven't lost their innocence, they haven't um, grown cynical yet, and so stay positive and don't grow cynical, and continue to build relationships with the world. To be perfectly honest, I feel that the U.S. government might not have the best interest of the people of Afghanistan in mind, although the soldiers are human, and there are charitable acts that come from being human. Uh, the ultimate goal does not look like peace. It uh, resembles perpetual war. I would like to say to uh, the Afghan citizens that as a soldier for the United States government that I'm sorry for one, for participating in war, but two, I'm ready to complete the mission. I'm ready to do whatever it takes to help bring peace to Afghanistan. And that we within the Afghanistan veterans community 
will rise for you and will rise with you. Toss your uh, Ali, Abdullah, peace. Uh, <laughs> it's such a bad job. Go say something. <laughs> Why not love? Why <laughs> not <laughs> Well, that's a good introduction to Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers and the Afghan um, Veterans for Peace chapter kind of uh, joining each other at a birthing moment in a sense. So I'm, um, again, grateful to Bob and Chris and Ian because we can now move into a next video which uh, is again one that's kind of feel good. It's, uh, you'll see young people very bravely marching through the streets of Kabul on March 15th of this year wearing sky blue scarves and John and I both have scarves like that on. There's John right there in a sky blue scarf and um, Doug and Larry will say a bit more about this idea of using sky blue scarves and wristbands to sort of cross a lot of different borders and help to champion the bravery of these youngsters, you know, they come from different tribal groups and it's just not done for youngsters. Even though Afghanistan is a country with 65% of its population under 25, it's just not done for youngsters to be out in the streets and promoting a cause. And it's a very political cause by virtue of their banners and their statements and they simply are saying, we want to live without wars. And they want their future to be one that's not saddled by overwhelming weapon systems invested in their country. So they're very brave. And they've paid a price, a price that has included arson and theft and death threats and displacement. And uh, so it's a, a wonderful thing that Doug and Larry will be going over to visit them in September. But this is the... Uh, March that I'm so excited about and uh to live without wars.
syndrome. Severe Afghanistan return syndrome. So, um, I want to introduce now to you, I'm sitting right there in the middle, Doug and Larry, and next to them is John. And um, I asked them if they'd say a word about their travel over to Afghanistan. It's um, a project that is so needed. Uh, they'll say something, I'm sure, about the practical step that they're taking. And please know that you'll go with our good wishes. Uh, Doug Mackey and Larry Kirshner. Several of, of, of you, I think, have been involved uh, with the uh, telephone calls to Afghanistan over the last uh, two years. Uh, I was talking with Kathy yesterday about how when um, they met Kathy Kelly and, um, and Kathy went over for the first time last year, um, there was a very noticeable, uh, very noticeable increase in the energy of the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. Uh, the work that they're doing is uh, very challenging and it's essentially a voice of Gandhi coming out of Af Afghanistan. So, uh, Kathy visited once and then again and again. And so, um, Kathy's been there four times and brought four delegations. Um, we knew when we started to get to know them that we would go over someday, somehow. And uh, we worked to, to bring a contingent over from Afghanistan last year. So uh, we've, uh, uh, we'll continue to work for them to come over to the United States. They were denied visas uh, when they were uh, applying last year. And uh, we've um, wanted to hook up with Kathy's delegations and uh, voices, delegations. And so we'll be, we will be going over in September. Uh, as a part of the expanded voices uh, for creative nonviolence delegation. With ours has an additional element in that we will be bringing biosand water filter technology um, to uh, the Bamiyan uh, province uh, with the help of the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. Uh, only 45% of the people in Afghanistan have potable water. Um, one in five children die before they're five years old in large measure, in the largest measure is because of uh, uh, water-borne uh, diseases. So water is a big issue in Afghanistan. Uh, we'll be able to work with an NGO that has been in uh, Kabul for 27 years and uh, be joined by their trainers and uh, we'll work with the Afghan people to help them make a business of building these biosand water filters. They don't require UV light, they don't require electricity, they just need to be used for 10 days and they remove 90%, 99% of the uh, waterborne disease uh, issue. So it's an honor to be working with them to create their own uh, system of creating healthy water for themselves. Uh, Larry is a bit of a writer, and if I do a little bit myself, we'll be sending out dispatches and we would invite you uh, to sign up uh, to get get these direct dispatches from us uh, and, and the voices will probably carry them as well. There's another project that I won't talk much about now but is prominent on the Voices front page and that's the Global Days of Listening which is essentially uh, hatched out, as Hakeem says, by the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers and I look forward to talking to you about this system of people listening to one another that, uh, that they've created and I think Veterans for Peace and its network nationally, perhaps through one of the working groups, could, could really help um, expand this idea of people listening. Listening to the people in, in Libya who will be in the phone call in August. Uh, and there's a big one on the International Day of Peace, uh, September 21st, that will include people from you know, many of the occupied countries. So keep your ear, ears peeled for that and remember that it is essentially from the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers that this global listening is occurring. And uh, thank you, Kathy, for this opportunity. Larry. Um, I don't really have anything more to add to that. Doug pretty well covered it. Uh, we wanted to go and be more than just uh, political tourists. We wanted to do something useful. And uh, when we found out the degree of uh, Afghans who do not have clean water, and the UNICEF report that says 850 children are dying every day, predominantly from dirty water. 
we thought that the uh, biosand water filter would be a uh, useful thing to do. So, thank you. Just heard from one of the finest poets of um, political social justice poetry, Larry Kirshner, and uh, a scientist and humanitarian par excellence in Doug Mackey. Um, you know, I was one of those people who felt drawn to be sort of Johnny OneNote. I focused on Iraq, and I didn't deviate in my focus on Iraq for many years, and I don't feel apologetic because not too many other media groups or action groups really were paying a lot of attention to the economic sanctions against Iraq. And so, through all the years of invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, I was not myself paying very much attention. I sometimes liken it to a, a job I once had at Rose Packing Company. I was a, um, uh, one, one of those students who went through university at the time when you could just about make it all the way through your studies and only owe your overdue library fine when you were done. And I walked away from my old university with 57 cents owed, and that was it. But that was also because in the summers I worked very hard slinging pork loins at the Rose Packing Company. And after about the first hour of slinging pork lines, I remember thinking those Jesuits better have some mighty good courses worked out there. And um, sometimes when I wasn't slinging pork lines, I was putting little iron chips behind small cubes of Canadian bacon. And every now and then I'd be assigned, this was like the glory time, to just uh, lean on a pedal which would splat the waste meat into plastic tubing and that's how they made hot dogs at Rose Packing Company and I did become a vegetarian that summer <laughs> and the next summer I went back again with my mercenary little heart to make 18 cents more than I would have made working at the Continental Bank. However, one of the things that just stays in my mind is that if any one of you had ever said to me until I sort of had this epiphany moment two years ago, Kathy Kelly, you slaughtered animals, didn't you? I would have said, oh, there are a lot of Kathy Kellys. You got the wrong one. I never killed an animal in my life. I'm a city girl. Uh -huh. Truthfully, I was part and parcel of the process of slaughtering an incalculable number of animals. And I didn't even know it. I couldn't identify myself as being part of that. And why did that finally come up into my actual conscious from my subconscious for all those years because I've been trying so hard along with you I know to figure out how can it be that we're now in our 10th year of occupying and bombing and night raiding and mauling and destroying another country and most people have forgotten about this war before it even stopped. How can it be? And my own awakening might not have even come if Jeremy Scahill hadn't come into our kitchen on Argyle Street and pounded our kitchen table and said, Kathy, when are you going to get in touch with the 21st century military? I said, huh, Jeremy? I just read your book, but <laughs> I didn't know what he was talking about. And so as soon as he went out the door, I was on Google and trying to figure out predators, drones, MQ. And I got some quick education about the drone technology. And you and I are always getting new education. I just learned today that uh, they're now dedicating $62 billion toward creation of 58 new Global Hawk drones at $218 million per drone. And these are the robotized military, count on lots of proliferation, the unmanned aerial vehicles flying over Afghanistan and Pakistan. So we felt at Voices, okay, we should go to Pakistan. We should try to hear from people who can't run away, can't escape the brunt of this kind of aerial warfare controlled from places like Creech Air Force Base and Hancock Field here in the United States. So that's what we did. We went over to Pakistan, and then we learned, well, you know, it's just a quick hop to go to Afghanistan. And so in May of 2010, Josh Brillier and I went to Afghanistan and there by phone made contact with Hakim and the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. But at that time I was staying in a very remarkable hospital called the, uh, sorry, the Emergency Center for Surgical, sorry, the Emergency Surgical Center for Victims of War. 
And one of the things about this hospital is that they don't ask any questions. They will stitch up anybody who comes to them. And so I found I was asking a lot of questions, and the doctors and the physical therapists and the nurses were sort of translating and thinking, gee, she's got a lot of curiosity. But I was mostly hanging out in the children's ward. And so I'd like to tell you about three of those children. One of them, Asmatola, he was seven years old. And he was just beaming because the physical therapist had patted him on the head and said, ah, he's a real paktun. All these changes of dressings, he's been with us now two months and he never cried. And there were these large, glistening brown eyes beaming because the foreigners knew he was a real paktun. And then there was Antitulla, and I could only see one eye that was always filled with tears. He didn't know which side had hit him, and uh, he had, in a sense, been a victim of maybe history. He had gone out on the mountainside because he wanted to help his family. His family was poor, and he knew that if he could get his hands on the brass inside of a landmine and open that landmine and extract the brass, he would have a handsome sum to bring home, but luck didn't stay with him at all. The landmine exploded. He lost three fingers and one eye. And the other little boys on that ward, and a couple of older ones, each day it was springtime and sunny and beautiful. They would get together with their crutches and their wheelchairs and their prostheses and their canes, and they'd help one another to move outside and stretch out a white sheet on the lawn and sit together. And even though some were Hazara and some were Tajik and some were Pashto, they all managed to tell each other's stories and translate for each other and they would even laugh under those sunny blue skies. But Adidula never left. He was too depressed. And then there was Saifullah, one of the older guys. And Saifullah had come from a place called Panshir. And in fact, I knew Panjshir. Um, I had gone to the hospital, the Emergency Surgical Center for Victims of War has three hospitals, one in the Panjshir area, one in Helmand, and one in Kabul. And I knew that Panjshir was a gorgeous area, striking beauty, but also, as Doug mentioned, when you think about 850 children dying every single day, you know, those of us who worked with the economic sanctions against Iraq trying to lift them, we talked about the extraordinary number of children dying. I can't even bring myself to do the math. 850 children dying every day from diseases like gastroenteritis, malaria, respiratory diseases. These are curable, as they were curable diseases in Iraq by and large. 850 children dying a day because of poverty. And we're spending $2 billion a week, $12 billion a month, to continue a warfare. You ask Leon Panetta, how many Al-Qaeda are there in Afghanistan? 57. 57! So that war is spending $12 billion a month in a land where 850 children die every day. So Saifullah, like little Adi Dula, was going to help his family and by golly, he did. He learned how to drive a truck, and he became part of a convoy. And he's one of 7,000 who would cross into Afghanistan every single day, driving the long convoys of trucks, trucks going along short stretches, trucks going along long stretches. Do you know it costs 400 to $800 per gallon of fuel for every land-borne and airborne vehicle in Afghanistan. How could that be? Certainly they weren't paying that amount of money to young Saifullah. How can it be? Because, okay, just stop a moment, let's think about the poppy production. 93% of the world's opium comes from Afghanistan. So my friend Nur al said to me as an agronomist, he sometimes had to watch the fruits mold because it took so long to get sign-offs here and payoffs there and get one truckload of fruit from one part of the country to the next. But he said, if you had a truckload of opium, you could have it on the other side of the world in 24 hours. Well, I come from Chicago, and there's a little bit of that kind of stuff going around Chicago, too. And, you know, people know what they're doing if they're doing a protection racket. They get seasoned. They get experience. So why does it cost so much money to get a truckload of fuel through the 
a port city in Garda in Pakistan, and up along the coast, it's a 54,000 kilometer porous border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, but every step of the way, you've got warlords who control the roads saying, sorry, but that truck's not going anywhere without protection, and you're not going to get protection unless you turn to me for it, because I'm in charge of this stretch of the road, and the prices go up, 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 and who's paying for it? We are. And where does the money go to the war profiteers inclusive of the very Taliban people that apparently the U.S. public is supposed to be safeguarding the Afghan people from? How many kinds of fools do they think we are? That is a problem. Um, so, Saifullah became one of these truck drivers. And of course, he's just making a pittance. And his luck held out for one year, and for a second year. But on the third year, Saifullah's luck ran out, and he rolled over an improvised explosive device. And you see the lead car and the final car peopled by U.S. troops have GPS positioning systems and have ways to um, be protected because they've got the MRAP, the Mine Resistant Armor Protection. But they're certainly not going to give that to these 7,000 Afghan and Pakistani drivers. And so when Saifullah drove over an improvised explosive device and blew up the truck jackknife, he was severely injured, his spine was injured, his clavicle was broken, he was in the hospital for a long time. And when he was medevaced by the U.S. They took him first to the free hospital, the Italian free hospital in Lashkarga, and then he needed more serious surgery, so he was transferred to Kabul, and I said, did the army, the U.S. Army, keep up with you? Did they? Nothing. He never heard from them again. No question of vocational rehabilitation, no question of compensation for his family, no question of concern, but he wasn't angry. But the story has to be continued a bit further. So let me say, I'm going to digress in a way, that um, one of the Afghan youth peace volunteers whom I've grown to feel very respectful of is Zekrona. And Zekrona uh, recognized that he hadn't really learned how to read and write, even though he was in seventh grade. And U.S. Ambassador Carl Eikenberry came to his village in Bamiyan and made a deal that Eikenberry would help to carry a letter from Bamiyan, the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers, to President Obama if Zekrullah would go back to school. Now, Zekrullah kept his end of the bargain. I'm not so sure about Ambassador Eikenberry. The boys never heard from President Obama. But Zekrullah went back to school. Now, this is one of the most hard-working youngsters I've ever encountered in my life. At two o'clock in the morning, Zekrullah will be up and he'll saddle two big baskets on either side of his donkey and ride six hours until he finds a place on a mountaintop where he can scavenge twigs and scrub brush and fuel for his family and then turn around in six hours back and then load all of the twigs and the firewood and the scrub brush on the rooftop of their home and then go out to get water and then work out in the fields trying to either harvest the potatoes or plant the potatoes. A very hard-working young man, so congenial. You'd love to have him be part of your family. Now, there are so many like Sekrula. These youngsters, you know, 65% of the population under 25 years of age, and they're hard working. This Italian friend of mine at the hospital said, Allora, they never stop to work. I want to build a playground for them. Yeah, but they're very hard working kids. Well, um, Zekarova would have counterparts among nine youngsters who were in the Kunar province, and they were out similarly scavenging wood. And suddenly, this was on um, March 1st, a helicopter gunship detected them and must have mistaken them, even though they were between the ages of 9 and 12, for insurgents. And so the helicopter hovered, and then it went lower. And then there was a bright green flash, and suddenly the helicopter went up and then came and executed each one of those boys except for one. And the one that wasn't executed had survived because when the shooting started, a tree fell on him, and so he gave his eyewitness account. And he told what had happened to the other 
eight boys that didn't survive. I'm sorry, the other nine boys that didn't survive. And I like to think that this is an exception. But if you go to the Voices website, I feel like the Grim Reaper's secretary, we keep a very macabre list. We call it the Afghan Atrocities Update. And there are night raids, and aerial bombardments, and death squads, and assassinations. And these are the methods of choice of the United States government at this point for prolonging and continuing the war in Afghanistan. So I asked Saifullah, Saifullah, if one of those night raids where U.S. soldiers come into a family compound and they bring dogs and lights and guns and they sometimes hog tie people and they pick them up and put them in pickup trucks and take them away. He was nodding. He knew just what I was talking about. I asked him if that happened in your village of Panjshir. What, what would you feel? Because you've told me that you're not angry at the Americans and I really respect you for that. You know, there he is, his body broken and his life so altered. And he said, oh, I would fight. I would fight to the death. What is the worth of the life without the family? So here we are with the night raids happening with astonishing regularity. For what purpose is very hard to establish. In fact, why we are still in Afghanistan is very hard to establish. And of course, it's going to occasion a desire for retaliation. It undermines Karzai's government because for 14 different occasions, he said, this has got to stop. This is my last warning. I'm not going to tolerate this anymore. And the United States, huh? And they continue through General McKiernan, through General McChrystal, through General Petraeus, and now we have Leon Panetta. Well, let me go through some more of that very sad chronology, focusing for a moment, if you will, on General Petraeus. January 19th. He was exultant. He was so pleased because of a military briefing he got in which the United States had managed to degrade, you know, I'm a teacher, I think, oh, did they get a C minus on the top? Degraded Taliban operatives. That means they pureed them, they killed them, they eliminated them. Sometimes on the basis of hearsay, it would seem. And so General Petraeus said, we've got our teeth in their jugular and we're not going to quit now. <coughs> Teeth and the jugular. And one month later, it was February 19th, he was called in, General Petraeus, to President Karzai's palace. And President Karzai said, look, what can I do? An independent Afghan investigation established that 66 civilians were killed in this raid that your NATO ISAF forces did. And General Petraeus said, oh, no, no. There were seven civilians killed. All the rest were insurgents. And so President Karzai's aides came out with the photos of children whose bodily parts were charred and boiled. And General Petraeus said, well, it's unfortunate, but that's how Afghan parents sometimes discipline their children. Oh. Huh? What can you do in these situations? And when his aide Admiral Gregory Jones tried to do a little flat catching the next day. He basically repeated the same thing. People are slapped on. And how are we viewed by other people in other parts of the world? And is this reinforcing security for people in the United States? And so we have this abiding need to try and ask ourselves, what is the reason for the United States to be at war in Afghanistan? And so I'd like to ask you to pursue that question with a little bit of map work. It's been useful to me, and I hope it might be of some help to you as well. Um, I'm just going to quick go through these photographs, and we'll go back to them. But maybe just to pause on this, uh, the red shaded province is the Helmand province, and next to it, Kandahar. And that's where so much of the fighting has been happening. And there are 34 provinces in Afghanistan, and 352 districts. And the districts are quite small. Like, for instance, there's this Gamsara district in Helmand province. And the Marines came into Gamsir in 2008 after a British team of soldiers wasn't able to hold this kind of hamlet from Taliban infiltration. So 2008, 2009, 2010, 
By 2011, three years had elapsed, and the Marines have been able to hold it. It took three years and three billion dollars. Now, if you read Rajiv Chandrasekhar.